Hello, everybody. We're just going to give another minute for um, people to join. Okay, let's see, let's get started. So thank you all for coming tonight to STEM students, unleash your creative writing skills. I'm Marcy Darling and I teach creative writing um, at Nova Academy and many other places. And um, one of my favorite groups of students to teach are kids who are STEM students. So into science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, a little bit about me before we really dive in. Um, I'm an author, writer, and educator. I'm a voracious reader and writer, always have been since I was a child. Um, I've written four best-selling books, one of, which, one of which reached number one on Amazon. I've written for many magazines and newspapers. I consult on college essays. I have writing degrees from UCLA, Harvard, and Stanford. Um, from UCLA is a bachelor's and from Harvard was a master's and from Stanford was a certificate in novel writing. Um, I currently am a professor at Endicott College and I also um, teach Harry Potter and Magic Treehouse and other magical classes based on children's literature. Most importantly, I have five amazing pets all named after jazz musicians. Dizzy, Ella, Bootsy, Princess Cream Puff, and Monk. <laughs> so um, one of my favorite books that I like to teach is by Mitchell Resnick. It's called Lifelong Kindergarten. So Mitchell Resnick says, why do brilliant STEM thinkers need to learn to write? In the process of writing, you learn to organize, refine, and reflect on your ideas. As you become a better writer, you become a better thinker. So Mitchell Resnick is the director of the Media Lab at MIT, and he also invented Scratch, which is a coding program language that is used and platform that is used all over the world by millions and millions of kids now. And um, he's all about cultivating creativity in his MIT students. He has them play with Legos and um, is constantly encouraging them to be creative. So I just wanted you to think to yourself, or you can put it in the chat, um, true or false? Math and science people are fundamentally different than wordy people. As some people are left brain thinkers, more naturally analytical and logical, and some are right brain thinkers who are more creative. False. This is a common myth. Oh, let's see who, what we got in the chat. Good job, Helen. <laughs> so this is a common myth. Um, advanced research in learning theory and neuroscience is dissolving this myth as our understanding of the, how the brain actually works um, evolves. We, scientists have learned that writing actually supports and enhances learning and processing of math and science. So it's not even that writing is just a good extra skill to have, it actually enhances and supports. STEM learning and writing support each other. So neurological research shows that the two brain hemispheres don't act independently of each other. They actually act in a much more complex, integral fashion. I'm a huge neuroscience fan. <laughs> so uh, this is one of my favorite topics to investigate is the effect on the brain. So cognitive neuroscientist, um, Dr. Kara, let me see that last name, Bettermeyer, um, is a professor of psychology at University of Illinois at Urbana, which is, by the way, one of the top science schools in the country. She explains that math requires a complex set of operations involving both hemispheres, creativity and the logical, um, more analytical side of the brain. So counting and remembering multiplication facts requires left brain logic and memory while performing complex calculations and estimating require right brain abstraction and creativity. So we need both hemispheres to do math. And yes, that does mean what you think. 
scientists, engineers, and technology developers don't need to look for creative people for help with their writing because they already are creative people. So, oh, this is one of my favorites. Quantum physicist Spyrodon Mikalakis was the scientific consultant for Marvel films, for Ant-Man, Doctor Strange, Captain Marvel, and Avengers Endgame. There actually were several different physicists who consulted on these, but he wrote, he said in a recent interview, the people that are changing the world and having fun while doing it are the ones that recognize what an incredible asset the creative arts are to humanizing and disseminating science. So keep that in mind. Creativity allows STEM students to innovate solutions and good uh, writing allows them to communicate their best ideas in ways that are engaging, exciting, and accessible. This can and will allow for better communicating your scientific discoveries and principles with the general public. So in addition to it actually enhancing your learning and your brain development, it will allow you to communicate with the, um, the rest of the world, all the things that you're discovering. This is Mitchell Resnick's creative learning spiral. So um, at MIT in the media lab, this is, and in his book, Lifelong Kindergarten. And the reason he calls it Lifelong Kindergarten is because he believes that all of life should be one long kindergarten but kindergarten as it was 50 years ago when it was just playing. Because he encourages his MIT students, he says, this is how we're going to innovate. This is how we're gonna create new solutions to our world's problems by imagining, creating, playing, sharing, failing, allowing yourself to fail, make mistakes, reflecting, and then imagining again. So um, I find it to be really exciting way to frame science at, and technology and engineering as a place to play. And it's not just Mitchell Resnick. Let's hear from some other top scientists before we really dive in about why writing matters. Writing is a very dynamic process because I never, well, this is just me personally, but I see it with many people. I never write only at the moment when I fully understand the problem. So I don't work on the problem. And then when I have 100% comprehension, I say, okay, now I'm just going to write up that story and I know exactly what I'm going to write. Writing is, a, is, is part of the scientific discovery. The other reason why I like writing so much, you know, it's essential for my work, but I also really like it because it helps me formulate my own thoughts. And sometimes, or very often, students don't think about this. I always tell my graduate students or students in my classes, if you really want to understand something, either try to explain the concept to somebody else, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, orally, or write it down. Write a story about it. See if you can get a good flow, if you have all the bits and pieces of this process in your head and you can write a really, really nice flow, flowing story with a good storyline that takes you from A to B. And then you show it to your friends or you show it to your mom or you show it to your, your partner and you say, does this make sense? Do you understand this now? And in this process of writing, I usually find understanding A tremendously when we're communicating with people that are not familiar with our field. So when you communicate with funders, with policymakers, with the general public to try to excite them about research, to try to show that we're really as scientists and engineer contributing to the greater good, of course you need to translate this in, in more of a simple to understand language and that is very very hard for a lot of scientists and engineers but i think that is because they never forced themselves to learn this so that was dr margo gerritsen who's a professor of energy resources at stanford and stanford has an entire um piece on youtube called writing matters where they have several different scientific professors um, speaking. She's a huge leader in her field, and I thought she had a lot of really valuable things to say about writing. 
This is Dr. Susan Holmes. We're just gonna listen to one more little piece of her. She's a professor of statistics at Stanford. If you're not familiar with Stanford, it's one of the best schools in the United States. And we try to improve it. And the ideas were there at the start, but the communication and the ease with which the reader reads it only can be developed in time. Our students are mostly very, very good at mathematics. And we realized that one of, their basic, one of the basic parts of their training is the communication with people from outside the field. So they take the data, they translate the problem into a mathematical and statistical problem, they analyze the data, and then they have to say back to the person in their language. Okay, so she told us a little bit about um, writing as a form of communication. So in a nutshell, um, results from several studies have shown that children and adults learn more and remember better when writing, and the results are even enhanced when they're actually writing with a pen and a paper because of the, um, the neuroscience of the multi-sensory, how humans learn with our senses. So more than just typing on a laptop, the actual act of making shapes with your hand, feeling the paper and the pen and listening to the scratch of the pen, actually stimulates the brain and we take it in in a different way. So writing has been linked to boosting memory and recall because our brains store information in memory networks. And a single concept can be stored in multiple networks, which makes it much easier to remember. Processing math and science concepts through writing gives the brain new ways to interpret information and creates neurological paths to store it. So it actually creates new neural pathways in the brain to do some handwriting, which is why I always recommend to my students to write every single day and just see what happens. So in this class, we're going to be talking about 10 tips and tricks to enhance creative writing. Writing tip number one, write every day. Commit to writing for 10 minutes every day. If you can do it by hand in a beautiful journal, I'm just going to show you my journal, but I don't have it here. Um, that's even better. Make it fun for yourself. Get a journal that you love or get a, a notebook that you love or a piece of paper and write whatever you want. It could be something you're observing, something you're hearing, seeing, smelling. Um, it could be first thing in the morning when you're trying to grab your dreams and talking about that or maybe what you're gonna do for the day um, or what you wish would happen that day. If you're writing lab notes for a science class, you can do one version that's more professional and academic for your class and one version just for yourself that's fun. Let your imagination run wild when writing for yourself. So there's no rules, um, no censorship. And another thing that um, writers like to do and encourage people to do is morning meditation writing, where you get up first thing in the morning and write before you're fully awake and you write whatever's in your mind. Um, and another uh, way to get your brain going into writing is a gratitude journal where you write five things every day that you're grateful for, but there's, um, a stipulation, it can't be the same five things every day, and it can't be one word like family, health, school, dog, <laughs> house. <laughs> you got to expand, make it more sensory, and it needs to be different every single day. Maybe specifically what it is you're grateful for about your dog. Um, the secret that nobody tells you is writing every day nourishes your soul and can transform you in unexpected ways. So, but I would encourage you not to take my word for it, but to actually do it. And then let me know how it goes. Let me know what happens. So another plus to this, as we just learned with the neuroscience, writing every day also helps your brain. It improves cognitive function. It forces the brain to think through matters in a logical manner. Um, and this effect is enhanced with pen and paper as we just discussed. And if you wanna get into the science of it, you can look up the reticular activating system and kind of see what it is that gets stimulated through writing, how your brain filters topics and processes things and determines the point of what's going to come up to the front of your mind. Very exciting. Writing tip number two is one of the number one things that I tell my writing students um, and even my college essay students. Find your unique writing voice. The first step. Okay, this is not the most, the easiest thing to do. 
people tend to want to write um, either imitating something else that they've read that they really liked or um, kind of sounding more formal or more logical. But to find your unique voice, that's what's going to pull your reader in. The first, but how do you do that? So the first step is to think about when you feel most comfortable writing. Um, in a journal, in a letter, in an email, a text to your best friend on your favorite social media platform. I find my writing completely changes if I'm writing a story for my sister versus a story for an unknown reader. Your writing voice is going to be different depending on who you're writing to. So if you're writing to a science teacher, that's going to be different than writing to your grandmother, which is going to be different than writing to your boyfriend or girlfriend, which will again be very different if you're writing to your best friend. So you're going to experiment with those, see how where you feel the most comfortable, think about what kind of style and word choice you use, depending on who you're writing to, and then practice that voice that feels most comfortable. I have been working on my third mystery novel, and I just threw out 100 pages, <laughs> 100 pages, because it just didn't feel right anymore. And I needed to rewrite it um, in more my style and my voice. I don't know whose voice I was writing in, but it wasn't mine. <laughs> um, so writing tip number three, show, don't tell. If you have ever taken a writing class, you have heard this phrase over and over again. I'm not crazy about this phrase because I feel like ironically, it doesn't explain what it means. And we're in the business of words as writers. So what does it mean and how do we do it? So I like to demonstrate this because I think it's far easier to learn it if you actually do it with a writing prompt. So um, this is gonna, the writing prompt is where I'm from, which is very simple, but let me show you where it comes from so you can feel, maybe feel about it the same way I do. Um, where I come from is oxen in rice fields and hills the color of green tea. Where I come from is jungles filled with jaguars and pythons thick as a grown man's thigh. Where I come from is poison frogs the size of a thumbnail and squirrels that can fly from tree to tree. Where I come from is waterfalls taller than the tallest skyscraper. This is from a play by Naomi Lizuka. And when I came across it, I just thought it was so beautiful. I use this writing prompt in many classes and you would not believe the beautiful, beautiful writing I get out of it. So I'm so excited to ask you all to just spend a little bit, five minutes right now. So I do a write, timed writing prompts a lot. And the reason I do is because the biggest block to creative writing is the critical mind. Our mind, every time we write, is going to say, don't do it. This isn't good. You can't write. <laughs> Don't bother. So our job as writers is to stop those voices um, and having a timed prompt helps that. And to say, nope, I'm just going to create. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to put it out in the world and I'm not going to listen to the voices. So um, I want you to write just two to three sentences and put it in the chat of where I come from, but using this kind of... Um, this kind of style. So don't actually tell us where you're from. You don't wanna say where I come from is California. <laughs> I wanna say, you know, where I come from is waterfalls crashing through the mountains or, you know, whatever it is that you wanna talk about. Um, and even though, so she never, you can go ahead and start on that now, but I just wanted to give you an example of showing not telling. She never tells us where she's from, but she uses, multi-sensory descriptive words, immersing the reader in vibrant, rich images. So we can use this writing prompt for many different settings. You can write a where I come from short piece for your, from your home, your town, your school, your science lab, even your classroom. So while you're thinking, while you're playing with the words, I wanted to give you um, three examples of the where I come from writing prompt from classrooms. And then at the end of the third, or within the next couple of minutes, I want you to uh, put your results in the chat and I'm gonna choose a couple to read out loud. Um, be creative. And there is no right or wrong. Show, don't tell, and write while I talk. Okay, 
So if I was coming from coding class or from a coding program and I wanted to write out where I come from, I might say something like this. Where I come from, numbers fly through the air like a murmuration of starlings dancing through an autumn sky, landing on clicking keys to create a land that's new. So I, um, oh, well, on Halloween, I, last October, I heard this roar when I woke up in the morning and I went outside to see what was happening. And um, I saw thousands, thousands of birds, blackbirds. I've never seen this before. Um, making shapes in the sky. They were all in my tree. They were all like making noise at the same time. And then they would all lift up and swoop into these different shapes and then land back in my trees. And I thought, what is happening? <laughs> What's happening? Uh, I've never seen this before. Am I in an Alfred Hitchcock movie? I don't know. So I actually filmed it on my phone and I put it on my social media and somebody said, that's a murmuration of starlings, which I thought was such a beautiful word because murmuration is exactly what they sounded like, which is a great example of onomatopoeia, a literary device that I love to teach because it's a great way to um, jazz up your writing and give it energy. An automatopoeia is something where, like a, a train that's rumbling. It's a word that sounds like the actual action, murmuration. Um, okay, so if I was coming from chemistry lab, where I come from, glass is shaped like a genie's bottle. Liquid pours with a splash, like a cannonball shot from a pirate ship. Exotic colors bubble and foam over a blue flame, spilling onto my white shoes. And where I come from, if I've just come from geometry homework. Where I come from, three is a sacred number, creating the most stable shape. Some five-pointed stars are golden, and I dance the infinity symbol, my body moving in a spiral like a leaf floating to the ground in October. So your writing prompt time is up. If you can put one sentence, two sentences, a couple sentences of where you're from in the chat, um, I'm going to choose a couple to read aloud. Did anybody get their writing prompts finished? It's no worries if you didn't. All right. So um, let me just ask you as you're listening, if you come up with your where I come from, just go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll read it out loud, but I'm gonna keep going. Under writing tip number four. So writing tip number four, create a rich and vibrant setting. Sensory details make the setting in both fiction and nonfiction. And sensory details are exactly what we're using in the where I come from prompt as well. Um, they really are everything in bringing the, re uh, hooking your reader, bringing them into your story, bringing them into your world. Um, in your rough drafts, you can make your settings drip with adjectives, knowing you're gonna edit them out later um, because if they get too much, it can detract, it can be more powerful with less, but you just wanna let your imagination run wild. I love writing settings. It's one of my favorite parts of writing. Um, and then I just edit them later. Uh, here's an example of a setting example, I mean, a show don't tell. So if you can please put in the chat a yes or no, um, is this effective or ineffective for describing a girl running through the forest? She runs really fast on a path in the forest. The trees are gorgeous and tall. Beautiful birds fly above her. The wind is blowing and the air smells nice. So can anybody hop on over to the chat and tell me, do you think this is effective or ineffective? I'll play some Jeopardy music while you do that. Do, do, do. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, okay, well, we're not having a lot of action in the chat. So I'm just gonna tell you, um, this is an ineffective way because it's telling me, it's not showing me. Oh, yay, somebody uh, put <laughs> into the chat, Gladys. Thank you, Gladys, you are correct. No, it's not. Good job, Sean, thank you. Um, so for a couple of reasons. 
it is too vague. The words really fast. I don't know what that means as the reader. It doesn't describe to me what you what the writer is trying to say. It doesn't evoke a picture. Um, the trees are gorgeous and tall. My definition of gorgeous is most likely different than the writer's definition of gorgeous. And same with the word tall. Beautiful, it's too big and abstract. Um, I need something that's more specific. And saying the wind is blowing and the air smells nice, also extremely vague. So it's not very interesting. So let's see if we use sensory details, if we can make it more interesting. Okay, so um, she's running on a twisting path in the forest. The thick pine trees soar into a cornflower blue sky. Blood red cardinals and golden finches swoop over her head as she races by like a trembling sunset. The air smells like evergreen trees and rain. The wind sounds like whispers and the ground is soft beneath her feet like running on pillows. So do you think this is effective or ineffective? For me, as a reader, this is far more effective because it's more specific and it gives me sensory details. Excellent, Rachel Sosusco, yes. Um, it describes the path. It describes how thick the pine trees are, what kind of blue the sky is, um, uh, the image of the blood red cardinals and golden finches swooping and their colors kind of blending together like a trembling sunset. I love that. I think it's so beautiful. Smells are a great way to anchor a reader. Um, and then the sound of the wind and the feel of the ground. So I got a lot of different senses going. There's also a caveat on this. You want to weave your setting into your story. So you weave Rather than writing a long piece about setting and describing it in detail, um, you want to keep your reader hooked. And the way you do that is by weaving it into the actions of the plot and the characters. I call this sardozi, which is the ancient Persian art of embroidering with golden thread. So if I was able to weave those details into a story, say something like this, she can hear heavy footsteps behind her. She doesn't dare glance over her shoulder as her afternoon stroll turns into running on a path in the forest, maybe for her life. She hears the heavy footsteps behind her move faster. The path is only one mile long. Can she make it to the clearing? The thick pine trees soar, and then you go into the details. So you kind of make a promise to the reader. You set up their suspense. Now they want to know, is she going to make it? What's happening? Who is chasing her? And then I can go along with all of the sensory details as the reader. I'm going to stay hooked. Writing tip number five that goes along with all of these, use concrete words. Concrete words, like the poisonous frog the size of a thumbnail, that is so concrete. And I, I absolutely love that, that image from the where I come from prompt. They help your reader visualize the action. They provide clarity and specific details to help your reader visualize the story. So out of these two sentences, which helps you picture the tree? The tree was nearly invisible in the fog, lurking in eerie dread with atramentous abyssal depths. Or the tree had gnarled branches and deep black holes in its trunk. Which one of these do you think um, allows you to see the tree better? For me, it's number two. Even though it's a lot more simple, um, I can see very clearly a tree with gnarled branches with deep black holes in the trunk. I love the first sentence, I think it's beautiful, but I don't have any visual of the tree except for the fog. And I also, as the reader, probably don't know what atramentous and abyssal mean. <laughs> so those are not great words to choose. Oh, good, we have another interaction. Oh, excellent. I was, okay, so I think she likes the first sentence better. I uh, agree with you because it's a little tricky because I also love the fog around the tree and the lurking and eerie dread. But as far as getting a picture of the tree, the second one makes as a clearer to me. The one of the tips with concrete words is that writing is easier with concrete words. And right, we always want to make writing easier. We don't need to make things harder on ourselves. Concrete words make writing pop, even academic and informational writing. 
So you want to always use specific sensory details. If your character is drinking coffee, describe the aroma, temperature, and taste. You want to paint pictures with your words and make sure your reader can picture what your character is doing. You want, in the end, you want to blend abstract and concrete. So actually, I would probably blend those two early sentences, the gnarled branches, the black holes in the trunk, and the eerie dread in the fog in order to really create a, a more lush, complete picture. Um, so that would be a blend of the abstract and concrete. But learning to focus on concrete first enhances your writing. And this comes with practice. So a lot of people think that writing just comes to people's minds and then they sit down with full inspiration and ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba, they type out some story. And that's not the way writing works. It actually comes with practice. Um, and I, you know, if I already know what onomatopoeia is, and if I already know what alliteration is, um, there's never, I can never practice it enough. Even as a professional writer, I'm constantly taking notes and writing down new metaphors, new similes, new alliterations that I think of, because as a writer, you're a word collector and you're thinking, you're always thinking of new ways to say things. Writing tip number six, how to create unforgettable characters is I usually recommend that students write a list of physical traits. So how the character looks. Um, and mind you, it's not always that easy to come up with at first. For me, sometimes I need to just get the characters talking and interacting with the setting and then what they look like emerges for me. And I have changed it a lot too. They might start with blonde hair and end up with black hair or they might start out covered in tattoos and then they might change it and turn them into, you know, a perky preppy cheerleader. I don't know. I'll also wanna think about their personality. Are they bubbly and vivacious? Are they quiet and grumpy? Um, the character's thoughts can tell me a lot about their internal um, th uh, thinking, obviously, but also about what the character's like. So if the character's thinking about life or death questions versus you know, what they're going to wear or what they're going to snack on after school. I just can learn a lot about the characters that way. I keep a character journal um, and I recommend for uh, students learning to write that they do as well, because it's very fun. You get to write down interesting people you see and you'll write down names that resonate with you. And so when you're people watching, which is a really fun activity, you can kind of just take quick notes on what they're wearing or what you know, there's certain things that stand out to you and end up using them in a story. Also, your character's actions is, are going to tell your reader a lot about your character. Like, what do they do before they go to sleep? Do they dance or do they read a book? Do they take a bubble bath or take a walk to the beach under the moonlight? All these things are going to tell us more about who they are. After you make your list, you expand on actions that you may or may not put into your story. But I always tell my students there is no wasted writing. Everything you write informs you, your writing, and your story. And it adds texture to your story and writing that is that wasn't there before. So this works for both fiction and nonfiction. Writing tip number seven, hooking your reader, which you really want to do in academic writing, in fiction, and whether it's an essay, any type of, of writing, you want to hook your reader. Otherwise they have no reason to read your story. So the different strategies for doing this are a unique title. Um, that's my first opportunity to hook my reader. A surprising statement, an emotional connection, or one of my favorites, in media res meaning, drop your reader into the middle of the action. And so typically a story starts with what they call exposition. And I'm hearing kind of who, who the characters are, where we are, and some basics of what's happening to anchor the reader, which is great. However, if you start in the middle of the action in an action scene, you hook your reader and then you weave all the details and exposition within that beginning part. Um, and it's a skill set that you learn by practicing. So let's see these opening sentences and see if they hook you. 10 minutes after meeting my future mother in law, I was wearing only underwear and socks. Or, Five minutes after meeting my girlfriend, I accidentally insulted her entire family. Or it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. So the last one is a story by Charles, I mean, an opening by Charles Dickens. It's a great hook. 
it really informs me of what the story is going to be about. Um, Dickens didn't spend a lot of time in the middle. We were swinging from the best of times to the worst of times. Um, the other two sentences are opening hooks, opening sentences of two essays written by teenagers that won the New York Times writing contest. Um, I personally am extremely hooked by both of them. I want to know how did you insult, uh, how did you meet your future mother-in-law and why are you wearing underwear and socks? And also um, after you met your girlfriend's family and insulted them, how did that happen? I really want to know the story now. So those are both excellent ways to start your story. Writing tip number eight. So for informational or academic writing, how to make it pop. A lot of writing rules are the same, whether you're writing for academic or non-academic creative. You wanna make every, all your writing understandable and engaging. You wanna hook your reader. You wanna use a blend of abstract and concrete details. You wanna explain why a topic matters. You want to know what the structure is, depending on what the essay you're writing is. Um, I teach research writing, persuasive essay writing, um, and a lot of them have different structures. So you want to know what you're writing, what those structures are. And you also want to have varied sentences and make sure your sentence structure changes often, which is a really fun part of writing, is to go back after you've created the content and to really kind of um, shape it and make it even read better, flow better. So and here's an example that I thought was fun of an informational writing hook. Why is it that cats always land on their feet? I love starting with a question and I was hooked. Oh, why do cats always land on their feet? Um, or this is a great opening sentence. When I added the third chemical, how could I have known what would happen next? That's just a great opening sentence. Writing tip number nine, increase your vocabulary with a game. I always recommend my students um, choose a new word in the dictionary, define it, and see how many times you can incorporate it into your daily speech to make it part of your speaking. So for my students, I give out the SAT vocabulary lists, and there are many, and there are some wonderful words in there um, that you can learn and put into your daily talking. It's a great way to increase your vocabulary with really fun words like jettison, <laughs> which means to throw something or drop it from a high place. And tip number 10, editing, revising, and polishing. These are three of my favorite parts of writing. When I first started writing, I did not like these three because I just wanted to do the creative part and I didn't want to edit and revise and polish, but I soon learned that this is one of the most fun parts. Um, the first part is really kind of making magic and this part is really like polishing that magic to make it shine. So when you edit, you may not have a great hook, but you write all the content and then you, um, then you go back and, and write the hook later. Or you wanna always remove all your repetition of your sections and words, anything that repeats itself. It's a really fun um, thing to do is to look up synonyms that replace repetitive words. Um, each sentence should move your story forward, whether it's your academic writing or creative writing. And you always wanna make sure that your voice, your writing voice is unique and energetic. When you're revising, you'll make sure all of your sentences flow. So it's not all long and it's not all short. Um, that your length varies, your structure varies, for example. You wanna notice if all your, your sentences start with he said, they said, those kinds of things, because then you'll wanna switch it around. To make it more interesting. And for polishing, you want to check your vocabulary list to see if there's anywhere you can add a multisyllabic word to make it really um, just better. Check your transitions, um, ask yourself if each sentence moves the story forward. Um, and this is what I always want to tell students as well. Your story could be the key that unlocks someone else's prison, so don't be afraid to share it. People are often, writing is a, can feel very vulnerable. People are often afraid to share it. But I encourage you to raise your voice and to be brave and bold and share your writing. That's how you get better. That is how you <clears throat> share your own thoughts with the world. And the world really needs your unique voice and your unique thoughts. And the only way they're gonna get it is by you um, writing.
and talking and saying what you think. So I just wanted to say uh, Nova's here. If you need help with writing or anything else, we do. We have our QR code here you can scan. Um, we have a writing courses, competition prep, research program. We actually um, prepare kids and teach kids about writing competitions, which are really fun to enter, public speaking, AP prep, and, and a lot more. Uh, we also have a college counseling program where we um, help students ninth through 12th grade, whether it's a last minute 12th grade essay someone needs help with, or whether you're starting in ninth grade and you really wanna lay out a roadmap, um, college essay support and interview preparation. And then if you are interested in any of this, you can schedule a free consultation um, with either Yushi, who's an academic advisor at NOVA, or Amy, who's our head of college counseling. Um, those are their emails. You can scan the QR code or you can go to nova.com and email us for a free consultation. And now I'm gonna open up the floor for questions. Does anybody have a question? I saw a few hands raised, but it looks like they went down. Jade Shu. Um, let's see. So Jade Shu, do you have a question? Where are, I mean, can you, Aaron or Trisha, how do I um, call, I mean, allow Jade to speak? Do, do they need to do it in the chat? Uh, you can just allow, allow to talk. Let me just, who, who is that question? Someone named Jade. Jade, did you want to, I think you can unmute yourself and just ask your question. Aw, look at your hamster. <laughs> so Jade, you're up here. Do you have a question? Or that was a mistake? Uh, sorry, it's just a mistake. Okay, no problem. Yeah, thank you. No problem. So let's see, we have a question from, share the tip number four. Okay. Let's go back. Um, I think I can go back this way. Um, okay, so we are going to, we need to get back to number four, Trisha and Aaron, who are running the slides tonight, or actually I'm running the slides tonight, but um, for some reason it's not going back. And, let me see if I can get, oh, there we go. Okay, so, oh, this is fun. This is like rewinding back in the olden days when I was a kid. <laughs> Wait a second, how do we go from number one to number, oh, that was number one under settings. Um, writing tip number four is creating a rich and vibrant setting. Um, one of my favorite things to do. And one of the ways you can learn about this and. I know um, you guys didn't want to share your where I come from writing prompt, which I completely understand. But I highly recommend that when you get off this webinar that you do it because I've had huge success with my students writing such beautiful, beautiful, almost poetry um, when they write about where I come from. So, um, okay. So it looks like everybody, there's no questions. So I just wanna say thank you to everybody for coming and, um, and spending this evening with us. And I hope to see you uh, in college counseling or in one of the classes. So have a great day, night, wherever you are. And um, I'm Marcy Darling and I'm just gonna say ciao. <laughs>